my friends, today I'm sitting back down with Mr. Larry. It is a slightly warm day today, and we are going to be discussing Texas Longhorn history. And Larry knows a lot, a lot, a lot about Longhorns, and every time I come over here I learn so much more. So I wanted to sit down again with him. I know y'all have been waiting for this video to come out, but I was able to sit down with him again and we're gonna pick his brain and he's gonna tell us some more about Texas history and Longhorn history and all that type of stuff. So sit down, grab a cup of coffee and enjoy. Well, it's, it's, it's really kind of a history of the United States. It's more it's than true. just Texas, true. but it involves the Texas cattle and uh, it's like God sent them. Mm -hmm. uh, ahead of time to prepare for some rough times, and he always does that. If you go all the way back to uh, the earliest records of Longhorn cattle, you can see them on the uh, hieroglyphics and things of the Egyptians, hmm. and uh, their carvings in the stone, uh, they're still there, and it shows uh, these cattle, probably oxen. An oxen is a bull that's been neutered, and so uh, their horns look uh, like they were longhorns. Huh. You know, they go up, turn out, yeah. and um, that's kind of the first record of them, but we know that people had cattle and um, they worked them. And so they worked their way up through uh, Northern Africa and around to the Middle East and everything. And uh, the, Texas Longhorns that we have here, they they came from uh, the Iberian Peninsula, and that's been uh, genetically traced and followed by a professor, I think he was at Cornell or MIT or somewhere, but um, K.K. Kidd was, uh, Dr. K.K. Kidd uh, did that, and so, there, there are about uh, four or five or six uh, Longhorns from that area, kind of specific breeds, but they're they're all mixed together mm -hmm. now, and it makes a better animal. And so, the Iberian Peninsula is where Spain and Portugal kind of stick out from uh, almost southern Europe, and so uh, it's a kind of a combination. There were two main uh, bloodlines that came out of uh, Portugal. I'm trying to think of their names now. Mertalingua is one of them, and the uh, Alan Tejana is okay. the other one. And then there's about four or five uh, from Spain, uh, Andalusian and Delidia, and those were the, the two main ones. And so uh, we think of those as being the, the Spanish fighting uh, bulls that okay. they had, they, you know, they're mm -hmm. hump shouldered, sway back, had horns that kind of dipped down, very ferocious, and so, uh, and, and, and they were used for that, but um, they kept those there and they used them, and uh, so how did they get over to, to Texas? That's yeah. a big question. And so if you look at Columbus back in uh, 1492, uh, Columbus was an admiral of the seas. I mean, he was pretty famous. Uh, he was financed pretty well, but he he knew a lot about sailing, and God sent him up the coast. They they have records of him going up close to Greenland, to the wow. north, and then uh, from Europe, and then back down to the uh, past Malta and to the west side of uh, Africa. And the Canary Islands are about 300 miles off of the coast of Africa. And Portugal had about 75 years before 1492, they had, they had found that and they had colonized it. it was very tough people to conquer and colonize. Hmm. But when you colonize something, you have to have a labor force. They didn't have any uh, Caterpillar or John Deere bulldozers, you know, they didn't yeah. have any big um, fancy uh, draft horses, but they had longhorn cattle. Hmm. And those longhorns, now, 
Uh, if you take a, a couple of big longhorn oxen, they can move any rock, log, anything you want to move. And so that was their labor force. <laughs> they can plow your fields, they can do anything. So they already had longhorn cattle on the Canary Islands when Columbus uh, started out. So Columbus, when he came to the Americas mm -hmm. and got credit for discovering them, you know, he, he left from the Canary Islands and his three little ships, uh, we have fishing boats, you know, on daily <laughs> tours bigger than that now. And so, but anyway, they left the Canary Islands and he knew that the winds, the trade winds blew to the west. Mm. So they blew, and so he got into that, and within three weeks he made it over to America. And he, he landed uh, around with the Cuban area there, he landed, uh, which, which is now Haiti, and Dominican Republic, but uh, back then he named it the Espanola. Okay. And uh, so anyway, he was successful, and because he had traveled up to the north, part of Europe and around almost the United States, he knew that the trade winds uh, blew back to the east then. And so he worked his way up the coast of what's the United States mm -hmm. and, and until he hit those trade winds up around North Carolina and, and uh, all that. And so he got on those and he went back to Portugal in Spain, so, or the Iberian Peninsula. So uh, it took him a couple of years to, to convince the Queen Isabella to, as they say, finance her jewels to support it. But uh, a couple of years later when he came over, to the, he wanted to go to the same spot. Uh, he had 17 ships with him. You wow. know, he was, a, he was not just a sailor, he was a salesman, you know. So, uh, and they, and those 17 ships were loaded with longhorns. Hmm. And they had chickens and pigs and fruit trees and vegetable seeds. And they, they, were, they, they came to colonize the, the, the Americas. And so um, and they had horses, you know, they, they had it all. So they unloaded all that stuff and they had people that wanted to come. Hmm. But it was a hard life, you're yeah. just starting out. But, uh, you know, that's a tropical area and they don't have winters. And so the grass grows all year long. And those are good things. And the longhorns, one of their assets is they, they breed early, okay. they live long, and they're, they, they're more disease resistant. And so they flourished. And so if you're going to colonize an area, you need something to, uh, their milk is, it's like Jersey A2 milk. It's, it's really rich, almost half fat. And uh, so they just flourished. And you, you need the, the bovine or the longhorn because um, you use their leather, you use their hooves, you use their horns, uh, use them for meat, you use them for milk. I mean, they, and the plow, and the pull, and so I can't think of any animal that would be more su beneficial to some people that are colonizing the land. And so uh, they had success there. And, and so, but they kept moving around to go to this island, go to that island, go around and move around toward Mexico, and within, 75 years, they had moved all the way around to Texas. Wow. And um, they were carrying the cattle with them because they've got to, they've got to build things. And, and you know, they don't have nails. <laughs> they can't build corrals. You know. But if they have longhorns, they would cut, when they'd butcher one, they would cut the strips of hide. Yeah. And you put two poles on a post. They could <laughs> dig a hole and put a post in, put two, three, four, five poles on there and you wrap some rawhide around those for nails yeah nothing can break that i mean it's there forever you know and so these were animals that promoted colonization and and better lifestyles so um i'm trying to cut a lot of it out now yeah, yeah it's it's a very big history yeah. 
So as they moved into Mexico and they came around into uh, parts of Texas and everything, they had great success. But the Spanish, uh, they didn't castrate their calves, and that means neuter them. And so uh, a poor quality calf could, some, you know, they, if they were strong enough and by accident, they could mate with a, a cow. And so the quality kind of dropped down on some of those Mexican cows. But later on, uh, you know, they, they spread because of lack of barbed wire. And, mm -hmm. and there were several Spaniards that uh, drove hundreds of them up north through Texas. Hmm. And uh, they were looking for the, the Golden City. You know, they, they were uh, rich and famous, I guess yeah. you would say, but they were explorers. And so they lost cattle along the way. In uh, 1690, they drove a herd all the way to East Texas, probably around the Nacogdoches area. Yeah. And, but they could only stay there about three years because um, the Native Americans ran them out. Hmm. There was there were two. There was the Caddos, okay, and um, which were heavily embedded in there, but they didn't take the Longhorns with them. And as they were coming to East Texas, what they did, they uh, they left a, a mare and a stallion and a bull and a couple of cows at every river they crossed. Hmm. And so, like the Brazos and uh, all those rivers. So, and and that uh, they flourished, and and that helped promote them. And but so that was in 1690, and through the 1700s, you have got uh, wild cattle. Now, the environmentalist theory is all true. Uh, the evolution of, of the developing cattle. So, the you know, the, the slow ones get eaten. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just yeah. the fact of nature. And, and if they're not the toughest, they die. They had droughts, they had floods, they had everything, but the strong ones survived. And they could fight off predators because they had horns, their horns got bigger. They, uh, they were just survivalists. They were, they were built for that. And by early 1800s, middle 1800s, there were millions and millions of Texas Longhorns. Um, and they called them Texas Longhorns because they were different from the Mex Mexican Longhorns. Hmm. They had uh, the ranches and the, the the caros and everything down in southern Texas, they would round up and castrate the inferior calves when they branded them. And one rancher recorded uh, he had castrated and branded over 30,000 calves that spring, mm. you know, and so that let the better bulls breed back and so they developed better. Now, the uh, Mexicans kept their herd separated by color. Hmm. They would keep all the red ones in this herd, black ones over there, spotted ones over here. And uh, in the Texas area, they didn't do that. That was too hard to do. So uh, that created another mix of better blood. And so they, they became uh, tick fever resistant. Huh. Their horns got bigger, uh, their bodies got bigger. And uh, they've always been good mothers. Then uh, there wasn't a market for them. Yeah. Because the only market they ever had for them was down around the uh, Galveston Bay area, the Houston Bay area. There was a need back then for tallow, which was the fat. And longhorns, you know, don't have a lot of fat, but they have fat. Yeah. And so around visceral fat around their guts. So, and there were so many of them, they just round them up, drive them into a corral there by the bay. Yeah. And they would slaughter them for their hides and sometimes for their horns and, and their fat. <laughs> they would just skin them out, scrape all the fat off they could, uh, put it in barrels and they would put down ships and ship it around to the east coast. Hmm. So they got leather 
this time cotton was really coming in. They had okay. textile mills over in England and up north, and people were begging for cotton. Because once you quit wearing a wool <laughs> shirt or buckskin, mm -hmm. and you put on cotton, uh, you don't want to go back. <laughs> you know, it was really in need. And so, uh, so you know, and they would just throw the carcass, the meat and everything, they'd throw it in the bay. <laughs> and one guy wrote where it said, Boy, it was hard to be around. You could smell it for five miles away. So the sharks and all of the shrimp and, you know, everything that eats meat and scavenger, they were having a party, I guarantee you. Anyway, that we had lots of them. If you have any questions, okay. you can ask them because my wife says I'm kind of like a a drunk one-armed monkey trying to get through the jungle. I just jump from topic to topic. But they all have value, yeah. you know? And so I don't know when to stick them in and everything, mm -hmm. so. Uh, but that's kind of how, they went from the Iberian Peninsula oh. over here, and then more ships kept coming huh. and bringing more longhorns, and they flourished, and uh, they were successful. Wow. And they gave us success. That's kind of how we got up to uh, the Civil War. Yeah. And and I say the Longhorn saved the United States, mm -hmm. not just the South or anything. Yeah. But, so if you look at uh, the Civil War, mm -hmm. horrible, horrible, low-tech fighting techniques, they say over 650, uh, the 350 or six, 650,000 people got killed in that yeah. war. Now, most of them died of dysentery, you know, <laughs> and because of germs. They didn't mm -hmm. know what a germ was. Yeah. And if you can't see it, it's not there. Yeah. So, but, uh, and disease, but but those big mini ball muskets mm. and things and cannons and grape shot. Oh, it was horrible. Okay, so after the war, four years of really bad fighting. Yeah. After the war, uh, the North had eaten everything trying to feed a huge army yeah and uh, they were bringing in conscripts from uh, europe you know the hmm. irish and things they were okay. bringing them in yeah, yeah. and and you've just come out of a potato blight famine in europe and here's somebody's going to give you food plus a suit of clothes and feed you two meals a day or three and plus give you a gun they've never owned a gun Say, so, yeah, I want to join. <laughs> so they said, here it is, take off. And so, but you got to feed them. Mm. So they ate up a lot of the food. They ate up every. They ate up everything they had. So well, the situation is uh, pretty bleak up north after the war. So you know, there's some cowboys sitting around a campfire like we are, <laughs> and uh, they said, look. We got millions and millions of longhorns just running wild. You know, they're getting away and they taste great. And so they were all grass fed then <laughs> and, and cactus fed and yeah. barbed wire fed and everything. You know, they eat everything. Uh, so I said, okay, if we can get these cattle to the nearest railroad, mm. we can get them up north and they'll have meat. And they were, boy, they were in favor of that. So, uh, and the cattle, the cowboys, that's how they got their name, they made, a, they made a lot of money. And all of that money was infused back into Texas. Mm. And so, right after the war, you know, I mean, 65, um, you have what they call reconstruction. Yep. It's a horrible time. To, the military moves into your county seat, like, in our county here, they would, there would be judges. We called them carpet beggars because they came and they brought everything they owned in a suitcase, which was made out of carpet. And it was a bag, so they were <laughs> carpet beggars. So they came down, they were appointed to be judges. The Southerners couldn't have judges. They couldn't have huh. law people. They couldn't have mm. military. They couldn't have guns. Mm. And so, and you know, the, the lady out on her ranch there, she had her husband killed. He didn't come back. And two of her sons were killed. And maybe all of them were yeah. killed. And so she's defenseless and everything. So there were, and the carpet beggars have got, uh, they're in charge of the county clerk's office. Mm -hmm. they, they've got all the titles to everything. And so 
uh, they came for one reason, and that's to take advantage and become wealthy, and, and most of the time they did. So, uh, it was a bad time, so yeah. these cowboys said, look, let's get to rounding these things up, and the closest railhead was in Kansas. So, they, they rounded them up, and they took off for several thousand of them, and they, uh, good night was a Indian trader and he knew where the best crossings were <laughs> on the rivers and things and he was down here and so he knew how to take them up through Oklahoma and that way and he got them up there and uh, they held them out in there till they could get some cattle cars and they would load them on cattle cars they'd sell them by the head not by the pound okay and they would overnight them straight to Chicago. And wow. Chicago was building, they already had some, but they were swift, swift and armor. They were building slaughterhouses mm. and adding on to them daily. So within a few months, they've got steady streams of uh, Longhorn cattle, Texas Longhorn cattle going to Chicago. Now, that, nobody's got refrigeration, but it's a lot cooler up there. Yeah. And, and so you have a lot more months that are, are cool enough to ship meat. So they're slaughtering them, hanging them, um, putting them on these. And, and they did save ice up there. They, ha they could put ice inside of a car, send it over to Philadelphia, huh. Boston, New York. They could, all the major cities. Yeah. And they're begging. Their restaurants are begging for beef. These people will pay anything. So... Uh, it's, it it went in and it they butchered them up, fried them up, boiled them up, whatever they baked them up, roasted them up, and people had food. Okay, and there was over. They started sending them up there in 1866, and it lasted about 20 years. About 1887 was some of the last one, and the reason it ended is they brought the railroads down here. Hmm. So. There was over $200 million of Longhorn cattle driven up the trail. Mm. Now, that's changed society a lot yeah. because we've hung on to that culture. Mm. It's gotten stronger. They made, you know, John Wayne made a fortune in the movies out of it. Him and Audie Murphy, I love to watch those movies. They're good quality movies. You don't hear any bad words. They've got a hero. They've got a pretty girl. They've got a villain. It's perfect, you know, and, uh, and they're tough. They ride their own horses, you know, and they're shooting their own guns. So... Uh, I wanted to wear some of the things. I still wear yeah. these things. They're good clothing. I wore a felt hat because they didn't have straw hats back then. Huh. The okay. only thing straw they had was a sombrero. <laughs> and it was huge, but it didn't go through the brush real yeah. well. Now, the hardest job in existence ever in the history of mankind, catching longhorn cattle in the Texas brush. Yeah, for <laughs> real. I can only oh, imagine. There was old mesquite thorns mm. are that long, and plus they had uh, Osage orange. Oh. Ooh, they're, they're, they're worse than mesquite. Yeah, wicked. And we call them bodark or horse apple. Okay. And uh, they made hedges out of them because nut hogs couldn't go through them. Wow. They have their, their thorns are that strong and tough. So you had to wear something to protect your legs. The yeah. poor horses didn't have much, but mm. these are the chaps that they wore. I wear them when I'm working cattle. They're great. I've yeah. got a quick pocket. Yeah, that's and, awesome. And as a matter of fact, I just found my knife that <laughs> <laughs> I castrate with. Right. And uh, it's, a, it's a razor. Yeah, and change your blade out in yeah. and out. So yeah, I, I didn't. I forgot. I've been looking for it, but it's in here. I left it last time. Still got blood on it from last time, but uh, you can do it. You can ride a horse with it. It's not binding or anything, but it's really thick. Yeah, leather and thorns will just, just you know slide of, by. Yeah, slide by. So that'll save your life. And um, they always carried a knife. I don't think I have my knife with me now. I use I carry a knife every day, and there, it's over laying over by the fire. Now the reason I carry it is because here go, I'll go get it. Uh, and and that's a newer one. <laughs> I carry it every day, if, whether I'm at uh, the church garden mm -hmm. or I'm I'm out here, and because uh, when I take my gloves off, 
I need to use my pocket knife, and it's in my pocket. I got to take my glove off, reach in my pocket, yeah. get my knife, open it up, cut the string, close the knife, put it in my pocket, put my glove back on. It's too much work for me. <laughs> so I carry a knife. This one is a quick connect, and uh, I put it in my pocket over here. This just sticks in, but I can jerk it out. Boom. I keep it sharp. Uh, Melanie, she's got her own knife, and we put out a, roll, a couple of rolls of hay for the cattle because that's all they got to eat. And she takes her knife, and so I set the roll down with my tractor, and she goes and she cuts nice. the thing off of it and pulls it over the side, and then I run into the roll with my tractor and get it to rolling yeah. out so they they can eat it. So we use a knife constantly, mm -hmm. and it's it's a great tool. And uh, so, but anyway. The cowboys carried a knife and they carried a pistol and I've got a pistol that I want to bring you and show you. Awesome. Uh, and I carry it a lot of times right here on my hip or sometimes over here because I can reach better yeah. here. And so we have packs of wild dogs that yep. people dump the dogs out here. And so uh, when they do, if they get three of them together, they yeah. want to kill something. Yeah. And it's usually my calves. Mm. And so uh, we had several killed this year. Then uh, a couple of years ago, they chewed the face off of a little mm. calf. You know, it was being born. Yeah. And so uh, we just don't allow that, yeah. you know, and, and uh, f for the benefit of the cow. Now, this is loaded, so I always have it loaded. There's no value in an unloaded cow. That's true. So it takes a big responsibility, yeah. but this is a... 45 nice. caliber long coat okay and that shell is huge and so uh this is what matt Dillon was you know she that's what all the cowboys carried right here and so it's a very powerful gun mm. uh it's guaranteed not to wound anything <laughs> <laughs> you don't wound it you know no. you miss it or you it's gone <laughs> so uh very valuable tool now, today. Uh, and we don't have automatics. Uh, I know they're good guns, they've yeah. got a purpose, but they jam. Yeah. Every one I've had jammed. Huh. So my wife carries a 38 Special, a Smith, a Smith & Wesson, and she's a lot better shot than I am. So uh, anyway, it's, awesome. a, it's, it's a, a great tool. We don't yeah. leave it laying around. Mm -hmm. It's secured at all times. And so, uh, uh, but that's one of the tools that they had. They had felt hats because they usually, the higher percent of beaver that the hat is made out of, the more water, water resistant. resistant yeah. And so, uh, I, I like a felt hat in the summer, but uh, everybody says, well, they're too hot. I haven't found that to be true. No, no. They're and, about the same temperature. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, they feel a little more comfortable. And when you're yeah. working up under a tree or something, yeah. it doesn't make a noise when the limbs are nope. <laughs> hitting it, yep. you know. And uh, I've got an old resist all hat. Um, it's a custom hat. My wife, Melanie, bought me back in uh, 82. And I love that hat. It doesn't even have a band in it. Huh. And I and it's so flimsy, it's yeah. just worn out, it's torn. Looks like it's got a bullet hole right here, <laughs> you know. And and it may have been, I don't know. But I doubt it. And so uh, I was coaching back then and she bought me that hat for Christmas and I have worn it out. And so I like to wear it up here. But she says, well, it looks like a Jeb Clampett hat. Get that thing off. <laughs> so, I, so I do. And I, I've got five or six felt hats that I really, really like. But, but if you think about, okay, uh, the culture. We've got cowboy churches yeah. now. It's a strong culture. And the reason is, it was strong people. You know, they were young people about your age, probably. They didn't have a job. There was, there were no jobs in Texas. Yeah. Had no industry. You couldn't have one. Uh, it was under reconstruction. So the boots were designed. Now these are uh, kind of cowboy boots. I think these are red wing mm -hmm. Pecos from the Pecos River. Okay. Uh, my mother-in-law was baptized in the Pecos River. Really? Let me tell you about that in a few minutes, but... Uh, anyway, my other boots have a sharper pointed toe, and it has a purpose. 
when you're having to get on your horse in mm -hmm. a hurry yeah. and you throw that foot over, you don't want it to hit your stirrup. You want it yeah, going go in right the stirrup. It. You know, it may yeah. save your life. And so um, everything had a purpose from uh, the bandanas to the larret ropes. Um, and uh, they had certain types of, uh, they called them bull whips, but they could pop them, you know, to, yep. to kind of keep the cattle moving. And uh, the six shooters, yeah. the guns were used with, they didn't try to drive a cow on these, they wanted to drive steers because the cow, they needed the cow to be back having calves. Yeah. But sometimes they got caught in a the herd, they mm -hmm. took off, and if they had a calf on the trail drive, it couldn't make it. Yeah. So they would shoot it and usually eat it. Okay. You know, for food, make a stew or whatever. And uh, so uh, it was a, you know, you're going to sleep on the ground tonight <laughs> and tomorrow night. Yeah. And for about two months, you're going to sleep on the ground and it may be raining. Yeah. It's going to be cold. Mm. And you're going to have four or five, six horses that uh, it's called the Ramuda, Ramonda, Ramuda. And they had a horse wrangler to keep those traveling too. And you had about every three or four hours, you had to go in and get a fresh horse. Wow. Saddle him up, get back on it, get out there, take your position. And they had positions uh, along the herd. The herd may be a mile long. Wow. So it took a lot of people to keep them going and they had to eat. They didn't run them, they didn't trot them. They let them graze, and, and water was a biggie. Yeah. The Red River was horrible. Sabine River was tough. Uh, they didn't cross the Sabine in its widest area because they went up northwest of it, just mainly. But uh, the Brazos River uh, and uh, the Red River was really, really bad. It, hmm. And in the spring, when they liked to take them, that, that was the best time because grass was coming out, but it's always yeah. flooded. flooded. Yeah. And so they lost a lot of cowboys and cattle, you know. Hmm. Um, so how much would a cowboy make in a season of cowboying? It was, uh, they got paid when they got up there. So okay. a lot of them didn't get up there. Wow. You know, they, they just didn't make it. Yeah. They got drowned or shot hmm. or run over or something. And a lot of them made it, but they were crippled. You know? <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> tough, tough life. And uh, but. But some of them made anywhere from 50 cents to a dollar a day, which is oh, okay. $30 that's, a month. That's, yeah, that's pretty huge. Good. Uh, my dad used to work in the 30s, 20s and 30s. He was born in 12, but he used to build fence uh, for 50 cents a day. Wow. It was the only job he could get, and so he did it. And it wasn't an eight-hour day either. It was like get there about daylight and you go home <laughs> yeah. about dark, you know. Wow. And so it uh, the week just can't do it but uh, you know uh, a lot of more vest or kind of a Mexican poncho because it had pockets and it protected you against thorns it protected you against uh, the heat the cold uh, it's a pretty handy tool so uh, they had all the tools that it took to be successful you know you probably you got one pair of socks so when you came to a creek and you got the cows through, you better, uh, you know, wash them, you know. And so, uh, oh, what a life. But yep. that culture was for tough guys. Yeah. And they were smart. Uh, and if you were the second or third time going up the trail, you made more money. Huh. You know, they might pay you a dollar a yeah. day. So, uh you had experience and you knew how to stay alive and you knew how to get the cows up there. And in the plains in Kansas, you'd have several groups grazing way over here and uh, they kind of signed up on a list, you know, like, I'm next, get on the train. And so then you'd have another group, maybe two or three, five miles over here yeah. and they were eating grass. And then when it came their time to get on that train, they loaded them up and they were building more train cars wow. as fast as they could. So they were long, loaded, mm. to carry thousands of head of cows wow. up to those slaughterhouses. And so it created some industry. The first industry it created in Texas was the ranching industry. These people had an outlet for their calves. True. And they wanted to buy about a three year old steer because of long legs. Yeah. And, uh, 
they could travel. And so uh, now one of the bad things was they were resistant. They had a lot of ticks, blood-sucking ticks. And so these ticks caused a fever in a disease. And so the, the longhorns were, were resistant to it, but the cattle on the way up there, they were not. A lot of the cattle died that they that got close to them. Wow. And so uh, the North tried to, well, that really stopped the drives, the trains coming down to get them, uh, the tick fever uh, contamination, and barbed wire stopped the drives. But it took about 20 years to do that. Okay. So they made enough money, and, and they'd go down, and they'd pay $4, $3 to $5 for a steer. And they would sell it in Kansas from 20 to $30. Mm. And their only expense then was the food and the labor of getting yeah. them there. So they were very profitable. If you had 3,000 uh, animals, when you got there, uh, and, and they were begging them, they were bidding on them there. You know, you may get $30. Yeah. And, and, uh, and if you didn't, if they offered you 19 or something, you'd just, well, we're not going to send them. We're going <laughs> to ease them on over here and let them eat more grass. And it's okay, okay, we'll do. They were hungry. Yeah. There's no telling what they sold them for to, mm. to the slaughterhouses. Yeah. It may have been 40 or $50. Wow. So they were, everybody was making a good profit. They were making rail cars, they were making engines, they were making everything. And they had some bypass lines where they could let a train go by when they were bringing another one, you know? It wasn't just one track. And uh, so the industry was good, but it's it's hung around. Yeah. And uh, I like it. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, there's no snowflakes in those movies. True. You know I mean? There's not... <laughs> <laughs> and so it was a sales job, and and they're still not. Uh, here's something about longhorns. When I was growing up, I couldn't I couldn't have found a longhorn. Huh. So I I show you know back then it was all block beef cattle, and and they're very good cattle. I showed uh, uh, the registered Angus steer. And he was great. I don't know how my dad paid for him, but he did. And I was in high school, and there was about 17 or 18 steers in this show. And you know, the judge, I remember his name is Larry Seaman. And he was the judge, and he was a great judge. I was, he, got, he starts picking you out and putting you in line as you, you know, you're yeah. going around the corral and everything. He starts moving this over here and that one. And I was in first place all the way. Mine was the wow. youngest steer in the whole thing you know wasn't that tall but boy it was fat and square straight huh. back wide block and that's what you wanted so got him i'm in first, still in first place he puts you up against the fence you know you've been to those shows you know and then he comes by not all of them feel texture now because of this but he comes by and he starts feeling the fat layers, you know, around there. And I'd fatten him up on a smorgasbord. I had barley in this trough and corn in this front and wheat in that one, you know, all the way. To, I mean, he had best meal, <coughs> but he was crazy. He was a crazy kid. <laughs> he was always trying to run through the fence. Huh. So Larry Seaman's touching him, you know, and everything. And my calf kicked him so hard. Oh, I felt sorry for him and he got at and he went over and got number two, which was a big, fat, horned Hereford. No, it was a pole Hereford. Let it right around and put it in first place. I came in second. So, so his disposition cost me a lot of money. And, uh, and one time I got a horned Hereford out of the pasture. That's what we raised. Because I got to get out of school for three or four days huh. if I showed a calf. And I hadn't even planned on it, you know? And so my ag teacher told me that and I said, well, yeah. So I went, got her out of the pasture. Now I'd shown her in a couple of shows. She always was taught beautiful horned Hereford. She's a little bit older. I was holding her out to breed her so she'd be more mature because they have mm -hmm. some hard times having calves. And I had weights on her horns that they were coming around, you know? She was gorgeous. Just been eating grass, put, ran out, put a halter on her, loaded her in the trailer, took her off to the county seat. Man, 
had a ball up there. And I got to take a person with me. He took care of her while I played, you know, and everything. <laughs> So they came around and they said, look, your, your heifer is a little bigger than the rest of them. I said, yeah, but she hadn't had a calf. You know, she still had her. And uh, she wasn't bred. They said, we're going we're gonna to put her in the cow division. Well, she was the best looking cow. <laughs> <laughs> and so one first place, got the blue ribbon, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, there was just so much you learn messing with. Yeah livestock you know it's real world things it's yep. not rumored you got to be tough yeah no no uh, it'll make you tough or yeah. you won't do it and so i really enjoyed all that but you couldn't have found a longhorn huh. i mean they just weren't so i know i'm doing a lot of talking but there's a lot no, of information yeah. Yeah, trying to and get it awesome. out to you because the world needs to know yeah. this i hope people look at it and so now i go to san angelo to the west texas state fair and every time I've gone in the last few years, we didn't go last year because yeah. everybody, everybody had COVID but us. Well, they have over two and a half times more longhorns at that show than any other breed. I mean, they're popular. Mm -hmm. They're coming back, you know, gangbusters. East Texas State Fair, same thing. Over two and a half times more longhorns than any other breed. Texas State Fair, we went there seven or eight years ago and bought a bull. The day before he showed, I picked him out to win. He came in second place. And uh, I can't say the judge didn't know what she's doing because it was Lana Hightower and she's the best judge in the nation. But he came in second place, but we got a lot, a lot better price on him the day before he showed than he did the day <laughs> after. So uh, anyway, uh, he was a great bull. We've got some of his calves in our herd, or his cows in our herd that we saved. At the Texas Fair, they have about two and a half times more than any wow. other breed. They're very popular, and they're very good cattle. They, um, you know, we, we have uh, people around, elderly people mm -hmm. within five miles of us. They love cattle. They yeah. raise cattle all the time. They've, they've gone to all Longhorn cows. Wow. And um, they put a Charley, they're not registered. They put a Charley or an Angus bull with them and they can take those calves to a sale and the people buying them will just, they will pay top dollar for wow. them because they think that they're Charleys or Angus, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and you don't want to run a, a Longhorn calf through there. No. <laughs> they, uh, they, they, they just don't want them in a feedlot. Yeah. And so, uh, it's really good. And so this guy wanted to show me, he was in his 90s, early 90s. It's been several years ago. I hope he's still alive. Wanted to show us his longhorn cows. And we, gosh, it's on the highway up, up here. And uh, we went up there, I, I won't use his name, but we got in the truck and we drove out in the pasture. He was showing me his cows. And he had a cow that had the biggest huh. and ugliest horns I've ever seen. <laughs> They were all went up in the air and crooked. It, it, I would love to have them. And he said, see that cow? I said, I've had her 28 years and she's had a calf every year. Wow. And he said, last year I figured we were waiting for her to have a calf and she never came up for about three days. And so he said, you know, we went off in the woods looking for her and, and we couldn't find her. A couple of days later, she shows up with a new calf. Wow. And she's had another one. <laughs> and, and he said, when she dies, I want those horns so bad. <laughs> and so, uh, so, you know, they do that. And they don't have to doctor them. They don't have to wow. fix them all the time. They don't have pink eye. They don't have diseases. Mm. They just have calves. And they can defend themselves. Yeah. And so that's a lot less labor and a lot more profit. And so there's just... Gosh, you could talk all day, which yeah. I gotta apologize for doing that. But there's so many things, that, and they almost went extinct. Mm. And so J. Frank Doby, that's a whole different story. He loved Longhorns. He taught English at the University of Texas. Uh, he quit <laughs> teaching because his uncle paid him twice the salary if he would go and be foreman of his ranch mm. to raise Longhorns. Wow. So anyway, he's he's written. I don't know, 14, 15 books about wow. longhorns and cow people and everything. Man. So he is, uh, he's dead now. Fought in World War I. <laughs> he lived in Alpine. 
uh, he was a principal at the high school. He went, he got his bachelor's and his master's degree in Southwestern in Georgetown. So he was raised in the Brasada County, kind of between uh, Corpus Christi and San Antonio. Yeah. And so it's just, to me, it's, oh, I don't know. If you don't like cactus, they couldn't live there. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they, they did. And his whole story of him is just wow. uh, droughts, floods, everything. Go bankrupt the cows mm. because of a drought. And so eventually, you know, he goes back to University of Texas. He teaches. He still has cattle. He just... He loves longhorns, and uh, he saved the longhorns because they were breeding all these British cattle into them, and they were, they were losing the longhorns. So, hmm. and he and a guy named Graves Peeler, they and four other guys, they found about seven herds of longhorns that were never bred into. Wow. One's in one's in Oklahoma at the Wildlife Refuge. Hmm. So. They start the Texas uh, Longhorn Breeders Association of America in Fort Worth. And uh, there was a banker there, I think his name's Richardson. He made a lot of money in Orland. He gave them the money to go out and find these herds of pure herds, purebred herds, and they started registering them. The first one was Sam Houston. That was his name, he was a bull. First one registered. <laughs> And so that we've been registering them there ever since. Wow. And ever since. And so uh, now all these cattle, we know that they came from 100% Texas Longhorn cattle. You know, nothing bred into them. And, and that's a good feeling to me. Yeah. It was hard to, uh, and that was in 1964. And so since then, it's built and it's built and it's built, and people have gotten to know the qualities of them. Yeah. And they want them, you know, and, and uh, they'll, they'll, they can make more money with them sometimes than they can the, the standardized meat processing t yeah. the technique. So, boy, I've, I've done a lot of talking because I was just trying to get it all <laughs> in, you know, and save time. But, and I apologize that to everybody about that. But, uh, what kind of questions would you have? I'm, Why did you choose to raise your own cattle? Well, we're retired educators. Mm -hmm. And so most all of our life, uh, we've owned some businesses, but most of our lives we taught in public school. Last year we taught at uh, a four-year institution, and I taught health. The worst thing about teaching health is you can't <laughs> call in sick. <laughs> and so... Uh, but anyway, uh, my wife and I, we, we didn't know. I, I was raised on a farm, but she was a city girl. So we raised our children in the city and everything, and, and God kind of gave us this land yeah. by accident. And, uh, but we look back now and we see it was a great mm. gift. We started out and everybody said, yeah, you need those black cows. And, <laughs> yeah, you need those red cows. And so we... we 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 putting up fences ourselves. We didn't hire people. Well, I, I hired my brother for maybe a week, you know, and uh, he was needing uh, some extra work and stuff. So he came up and helped us, but uh, we still do all of our work. She brands the cattle. <laughs> you know, not many women, and she's not big, hairy-armed either. No. She's, the, she's the cute little, little lady that's sweet and smart, and so uh, she brands them. But she can work. I'd rather build fence with her than anybody. I'm telling you, we can, we do it. We, she pins cattle better than mm. I do. She loads cattle better than I do. She does everything better than I do. And so, uh, so we just got tired of public education. Yeah. And so we retired and we came up here. And so the black and red Charlotte stuff, it, we had a lot of them die. Yeah. And they didn't work out. So I hired a different guy to buy them for us. And so he brought us about 15 or 16 Angus and everything we had. He brought, and he couldn't find steers. He brought heifers. And he had these little longhorn heifers and their little horns about that long. <laughs> they were just weaned, you know, and they didn't come from the same ranch. He bought some down in Louisiana. Hmm. He brought them and put them out here and the little longhorns 
they would not associate with the other cattle. They stayed together. They knew they were different, yep. and they would eat together way over here. And we had, I think, uh, two Angus die of that group or three, and one of the sick ones tried to go over there to get around the longhorns, and one of the little longhorns saw it coming. It ran out and attacked it <laughs> and ran it off, would not let the sick calf around them. Mm. I thought, we, we were there watching that and said, well, that's pretty smart. So I told my wife, I said, you know, this, this really isn't our, our main income here. Yeah. I said, it's, it's something we enjoy. Let's just start buying longhorns. <laughs> <laughs> Started buying longhorns. And we have been, so, they're prettier. Yeah. They're smarter. They, they just, they just fit us, you mm -hmm. know, don't fit everybody. Yeah. But, but, uh, you know, I got some cows over there in the shade, uh, Lucy and Ethel. Well, Ethel's not there, but. Lucy, she's a redhead. That's how she got the pink name, Lucy. <laughs> First two registered animals. We were buying them from this lady over, and uh, and so Cheryl said, "Look, you got to name them." <laughs> you know, I'm filling out the registration papers. You know, and I, she, and with well, one's got a redhead, and one of them's kind of red roan, kind of a gray. The Lucy and Ethel. You know, <laughs> the I love Lucy show. None of the younger viewers won't even know what that is, but uh, us old people do. And so they have made us so much money. We don't have to do anything to yep. them but feed them. <laughs> and she has a calf every year. Wow. And she's the best mother. That's her calf laying down beside her right there. And she's about to have another one. Wow. But he's weaned because she weaned him. Yep. She's a timeout boy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she'll have a great calf every year. That's awesome. And so. We just, we, it's it's a tough, hard business, but we love it. Yeah. And it gives us a purpose in life. You know, in our garden, we have mm -hmm. an acre and a half garden, church garden, we give the food to our elderly members of our church, but we don't use chemicals. Yeah, that's awesome. And so we try to raise the best food possible. And up here, we try to raise the best food possible. And that's it. And so, we eat that food, so we think maybe God will bless us and keep us alive. <laughs> we may die tomorrow. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. But that we're going to yeah. do what we're going to yeah. try to do anyway. Yeah. And uh, so it, it's been an adventure. And uh, I'm married to the best woman in the world. Uh, she works so hard. She, I was coaching, and she was uh, she raised our children almost because I'd come in at 9 o'clock at night. And so she had to do everything, and I admire her for that, and I thank her for that because our boys turned out good. So do you think ranchers, small-time ranchers, is the solution to big ag? Uh, yeah, because there's so many more of us. Mm -hmm. It's a True. numbers game, and uh, financially, you can't buy 500 acres anymore. True. Uh, unless you want to buy it from the Chinese <laughs> <laughs> or, or Bill Gates. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, so they're trying to get control yeah. of things. And uh, so even if you got, you know, a lot of the Longhorn ranchers are small. Like we bought our, the bull we bought at the State Fair of Texas, he has 17 acres. Wow. And so uh, it's up in North Texas and everything, but he raises show cattle. So, you know, he just loves to show his girl, six years old, when she showed my, the bull I bought in the arena. Mm. She was a little skinny thing about that tall, six years old, leading that bull mm. around. So he trains them really well, R4 Ranch. And uh, he raises, he doesn't have to be big to go quality. You mm. see what I'm saying? Yeah. And he, he selects his, the best he can get. And same way with most of the ranchers now, there are some big ranches out in yeah. West Texas. They have mm. to because yeah. uh, we were at a restaurant one night in, in the hill country, outside restaurant, Fredericksburg, and we're sitting inside this really nice couple. We were waiting on some kin people to drive in and, and we were eating and they were just a nice couple. So we just struck up a conversation, sitting real close to them. And they, they were from there and they had 1,200 acres. Wow. Right there, right outside the city. So I'm fit, and they, weigh, they raise Brangus, and I'm, you know, everybody asks you, well, how much land do you have? Yeah, yeah. Yep, I hate that. Uh, you know what I started telling them? <laughs> what? You know, you're at a show with something, well, how much land do you have? And I said, well, pardon, I don't know. I said, 
we ain't never found the back fence. <laughs> and that messes them up. <laughs> so, but it saves the answer, yeah. you know. Yeah. I'd like to say, oh, we got a couple of thousand, but, you yeah. know, we don't. Yeah. And uh, this guy, 1,200 acres. Wow. Had 40 cows. Total. <laughs> 40 cows. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't say anything, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the land's different. You know, they Is it just like less less grass and everything? Oh yeah, they got rocks. And they don't eat rocks. <laughs> <laughs> it's just rocks. <laughs> and a blade sticking up between this rock and that rock and that. But it'll carry 40. And he loves it. He loves cattle. He told me. That's awesome. They go out, to, but think about the roundup in order to get them in a pen. When you got to go over 12, 1,200 You need a helicopter. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, so in West Texas, it's measured in sections. And, uh, you know, that's what, 620 or 640 acres per section? We don't do that in East Texas, yeah. but... Uh, and land has to be way cheaper out there, too. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, it is. It is. Just because not a lot of people live out there. Oh, and, yeah, there's no you know, water. Yeah. And uh, there's, you know, we have a lot of... If you didn't have the trees and things mm. here in East Texas, We'd call this the hill country. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, yep. it's just up and down. Yep. And up and, but we can't see them because of the trees. trees yeah. And so it really makes it pretty. It knocks off the wind. Yeah. And that's a good thing uh, sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we love it here. Uh, we've been to Scotland and England and places like that. And it's such a relief to get back yeah. to Texas. Well, thank you so much for watching today's video. Thank you for letting me sit down and pick your brain and listen to Texas history and American history as well. And uh, it's a great history. Yeah, it, it really is. is. And it really is. We wouldn't. We may not have been here if it hadn't been for the Longhorn. True. Very so. much so. It would be a, definitely a different story without the Longhorn. Yeah. So, anyway, y'all, thank you so much for uh, watching today's video. We will catch y'all on the next video. Bye bye.